watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. Download Bealy now. Today's housewife might seem to have it all. The beautiful house, a loving husband, gorgeous children and the choice to work or stay at home. But behind the closed doors of Britain's neat suburban houses, there are women waging a secret war with food. I'm either anorexic or bulimic. I just can't be, can't be normal. It's not just teenagers suffering from eating disorders. Anorexia and bulimia are now on the rise amongst older women. Anorexia doesn't happen to a mother of two in her 30s, you know. She's got better things to think of, or she should do. To find out why these women starve, binge eat and make themselves sick, I spent a month talking to women who let me into their private worlds of food, control and guilty secrets. Tracy is desperate to stop binging and throwing up. Jane knows she needs to help keep her weight out of the danger zone. Zoe's in recovery from severe anorexia, but still struggles with unhealthy thoughts about food. And Georgia is trying to lose her baby weight without spiraling back into full-blown anorexia. Oh, bless you. <laughs> On the surface, 54-year-old Jane seems to have it all. After selling up the family business four years ago, Jane and husband Graham moved to their dream home in the Cotswolds. I've got this beautiful house, beautiful family, everything going for me, and yet I have an eating disorder. For 30 years, Jane's been secretly battling with anorexia and bulimia, a vicious cycle of self-starvation, binging and vomiting. It's better. I go in and out of bouts of being anorexic. But it's just, I need to get on top of the bulimia. I need to control it rather than it control me. Jane won't reveal to me what she weighs, but her clothes hang off her and she's incredibly thin. I ask her to look in the mirror and tell me what she sees. Gosh, this is uncomfortable. <laughs> when I was thin, I didn't look like looking at myself because I knew I was ugly. So I didn't like looking at myself in the, in the mirror. And now I feel, I feel large, so I don't look at myself. Not happy with my bottom or my thighs at the moment. They're much larger than I would like them to be. And that's the battle that's going on all the time, is that I'm feeling large. And I have to keep saying, I'm not, I'm not. But I feel it. This is the family room where I suppose the children would use the expression, everybody chills out. But Jane's children are all away at school or college, largely because she's been hospitalised so many times for her anorexia. The children, they're angry with me. And because they feel like that, it actually makes me worse. I feel I need to be punished for being so wicked to them. So it doesn't help. But I can understand that they're angry with me. Jane's anorexia has led to her being critically ill. Only three years ago, she was down to a shocking six stone. Jane confesses that food is still her enemy. The way she deals with food is to categorise it. White is good and black is bad. Bread is black. Biscuits, definitely black. Pasta is black. French beans, they're white. Vegetables are white food, apart from a carrot. That's grey, because that swings from being a black to, to, to a white, because my white foods are my comfort foods, safe foods. And the, after I've eaten white foods, I'm happy. I don't feel guilty. I feel I deserve my white foods, and I won't want to be bulimic after I've eaten them. Black foods are my bulimic foods. All this started in Jane's early 20s, when just before their wedding, 
Graham was diagnosed with cancer. Neither of them knew whether he would make it. The stress caused Jane to begin her strange relationship with food. 30 years on, and the only food she feels completely safe with now is porridge. I always put water in. I, don't, I never make my porridge with milk. Right, there it is. Forming a skin, not, not quite enough skin, but very edible. <laughs> she just goes through bowls and bowls and bowls of it, which is her only real form of carbohydrate she has at all. And it seems to be her staple diet. But there's not a lot of calories in it. Jane's bulimia is... She tries to hide it. Uh, it's secrecy is the big thing. They don't particularly want you to be around when they're eating and they certainly don't want you to be around when they're making themselves sick. I mean, have you ever witnessed the purging, the vomiting or...? No, hurting? she's very... She's always shut the bathroom door and locked him. And, um, which is one of the reasons why, for years and years and years, I didn't realise what was going on. Jane says she's currently binging and vomiting twice a month. But I'm told people who suffer from eating disorders often lie about what they're eating or how often they throw up. Only Jane knows the truth. I won't allow myself to binge during the day. I only ever do it last thing at night. Graham sees the signs because I start getting fidgety. Towards the end of the evening, I start bobbing up and down and going out into the kitchen and getting something to eat and shoveling it in my mouth quickly. Jane admits she waits until Graham's gone to bed. Then she makes herself sick. And I always drink lots of liquid as well because, obviously, oh, this is horrid, but it comes up much easier if there's fluid around it. Obviously, if it's dry, it can get stuck. I didn't ask, but I think she, I think she made herself sick last night. But um, that, that may be me doing her an injustice. Every two months, Jane goes to see her doctor so he can weigh her and check she's not spiralling back into the danger zone. No, good girl, good girl, good girl. Jane's next appointment is due soon. She tells me that the prospect of a weigh-in is making her anxious and so more likely to binge and vomit. Every time I do it, I say to myself afterwards, never again, never again, and then it happens again. Jane's not unusual. Two in every hundred women in the UK are bulimic. Tracy from Kent is a 36-year-old single mum of two. She works full-time in a bank and is also studying for a law degree. But last night, like most nights of the week, Tracy gorged herself and then forced herself to throw up. What happens on an evening when you, when you come to these covers? Yeah. Right. How does it work? Well, yeah, I'm not... It's not an intentional... Well, I don't actually have a set pattern. I mean, most of the time, I, I generally would binge on cereal, breakfast cereal, so it depends. Not wheat a bit, so I try and buy ones that I don't like so that I don't eat them, but it doesn't work. Um, I... Sultana Bran is usually a good one for me. That sounds awful. Um, Frosties, things like that, and I'll probably eat two, three bowls of... Um, cereal with milk and sugar. Bread is, is lethal, so I keep the bread and then the rolls in the freezer, take two out in the morning, or oh, enough for that day's lunches, and a filling. Um, and so that's another way of trying to combat it, because so far I don't appear to be eating frozen food, it's only the stuff that's defrosted. And likewise, I keep up here all the children's sort of flat jacky bar things for, you know, little mini cookies and things like that, and they're fatal because you can quite easily eat four or five of them and not realise that actually how much you have eaten and, you know, one packet becomes another. And it's not until perhaps the following morning that I look in the bin and think, oh, my God, how many wrappers? And that's when it's a bit mortifying because it's a bit depressing. Daniel, I've only given you exactly what you said you wanted, so it would be lovely if we have a nice clean plate, Mr Man. And, of course, you, madam, if you want any more later, you can have some. All right? I'm just going to get on with the ironing, OK? Barely eating during the day, Tracy waits until children Daniel and Emily have gone to bed. Then, in secret, she binges. 
I'm binge on average at the moment about four times a week, perhaps five times a week, which isn't good. I'll think, oh, I'm, do you know what, I'll just have a bowl of cereal. And then, then I think, you shouldn't have eaten that. And then I think, oh, it was nice, I fancy another, so I'll have another bowl of cereal. And then I'll think, well, that's it, you've blown it now. You might just as well eat what the hell you want and get rid of it all. And it takes me longer to bring it back up again than it did to eat in the first place, which is, you know, horrific. I, I might stop eating at sort of midnight, but I'll still be up to half past two throwing up. Daniel, do you want a yoghurt, mate? OK, you will have some, though, won't you, later? I was surprised to discover that until four years ago, Tracy had never had any issues with food. But then her mum died, closely followed by the collapse of her marriage. The breakdown of my marriage was kind of the last straw, really, but I think the underlying problems were already there from way back. I'd been abused as a child, never dealt with that, wasn't talked about in those days, just ignore it, move on. My parents had a, a you know, not a very good marriage. They split up, had a couple of miscarriages, which I never really addressed. So I think that's how it started. I think that it was, it became a warped sense of control. It never really had anything to do with how I looked. It's entirely to do with how I felt about myself, how I still feel about myself. I don't mind you staying up feelings of, of worthlessness and you shouldn't have said that, you're a bad mum and you made a mistake at work, God, you're a, you're a crap employee. That's what it is. It's the inner emotions and the way they manifest. It's not, I want to look like Posh Spice. It's nothing like that at all. After four years of binging hell, Tracy tells me she's desperate for help, but there's little available to her. Unlike anorexics, bulimics aren't in danger of starving themselves to death. She puts on a brave front, but underneath, I sense Tracy's at breaking point. Tell me what you normally do after you purge. <clears throat> well, always we'll use the downstairs loo because then the children don't um, hear me, they won't know. Um, and depending on how bad, how bad, Badly sick I am. I clean up afterwards, obviously, um, because I'm terrified of the kids coming downstairs the following day and seeing remnants of things. Um, so I will always clean the toilet, um, the bowl and everything else. And then if I need to, if um, then I will wipe down the walls and the floor as well. Anything that... Um, could give me away, basically, from what goes on behind this door when they're asleep. Tell me what you're feeling now. Shame, terrible, terrible shame. Because I'm a fully grown woman. I have two children. I have a job. I'm studying. I'm a sensible person, so why do I do this when nobody's around? And I'm so terribly ashamed of it. So ashamed of it. I love you, but I've got to stay. 36 year old Zoe's eating disorder developed five years ago. Two years of intensive cognitive behavioural therapy, and Zoe's now in recovery. But when I visit her at home, she tells me how the fear of anorexia can still affect her life. When Zoe feels she's losing weight, she weighs herself to get back on track. 43.9. That not very good. <laughs> it's, um, well, less than seven stone. For most of my life, I've felt happy when my weight's gone down. Right now, I feel quite worried, actually. Um, I probably need to take it easy more than I have done. I, I think I've been quite busy this week. Um, because I've certainly been eating well, I know I've been eating well. 
She keeps a chart of her BMI, or body mass index. It's a tool she's learnt from therapy to monitor her weight. A healthy BMI is anywhere between 20 and 25. Anorexia is 17.5 or below. I'm presently um, just below a body mass index of 18, which is underweight. Um, and that, for me, is seven stone. Right now, I feel way too thin. I feel quite self-conscious of the way I look. May definitely in summer clothes as well, feel too bony. Um, my best clothes aren't fitting me as well as they did last year. So I want to try and gain back that half a stone. A continuing downward trend in her weight could develop into full-blown anorexia. Only four years ago, Zoe weighed just over five and a half stone. I was even more surprised to learn that Zoe's anorexia took hold while pregnant with her second child, Barnaby. I felt just overwhelming guilt not to be able to eat properly. It would be so distressing because I would go to bed hungry and I kept lying there thinking I should get up and eat something. But yet yeah, not being able to was just something stopping me, being able to just put that food inside me. Zoe's husband, Rob, was unaware of the extremes his wife was going to to deprive herself of food. Anorexia is a, is a deceitful disease. There are simple things like sort of hiding the fact that um, she hadn't eaten the food or saying, oh, I had something else beforehand. I've had enough now. I don't want to eat this. I had a big lunch or I had a big snack instead. <laughs> instead of getting bigger, Zoe didn't gain any weight during her pregnancy. This made her terrified of what she might have done to her baby. All I kept saying was, he's not ready to come out yet. We need to just stop the labour. He's not ready yet. And I remember turning to Rob and just saying, I feel so depressed. I was absolutely convinced that he was going to be born either dead or terribly deformed in some way. Baby Barnaby was born healthy, but just nine months after the birth, Zoe was three and a half stone lighter than when she had conceived him. Dangerously ill, Zoe was referred by her doctor to an NHS course of cognitive behavioural therapy. As part of her treatment, Zoe was asked to keep a food diary. It shows just how extreme the situation was. I used to get up at four o'clock every day. I had for breakfast a glass of skimmed milk, a small banana and half a kiwi fruit. At seven o'clock, went swimming and I swam 50 lengths. Got back and had just a mug of hot water. One cashew nut was my snack at 8.30 in the evening. I, I've eaten this cashew nut. I feel enormous. I'm not sure I'll sleep for worrying. In the last four years, Zoe's come a long way from those dark days of starvation. Since Zoe has completed her treatment and is now definitely a recovering, almost recovered anorexic, um, I think, the, looking at her now compared to how she was when she um, was in the, the depths of anorexia, the, the change is, is enormous. Through therapy and with Rob's support, Zoe's learnt to eat three meals and three snacks each day, despite her anorexic thoughts. I'm often struggling with thoughts of fullness equals fatness in my head still quite a lot. If, before I can reason over it, that's my automatic reaction is I feel full, therefore I feel fat. So I have to use these uh, cognitive behavioural therapy techniques to tell myself, well, actually, I know I'm not fat. This is just a feeling of fullness and it will pass. Now, no food is off limits, but Zoe still gets anxious if she has to be spontaneous and eat outside her routine. Now what I find difficult is if my routine has to change for some reason, then I start to feel very sort of wobbly and I haven't got anything to cling on to. It's like my scaffolding in a way and it's taken away. We need to measure it first. It's too much. 
Zoe's been invited to go out for a meal with friends in two weeks' time. It's something she really wants to do. I need to be a normal person. I need to just go into a restaurant, look at a menu, order something and eat it and enjoy the social occasion rather than thinking too much about the food or the effect that that will have on me. Has that got my... I can see Zoe's really determined. I hope she makes it. With her children away from home, no job to go to and a larder full of food to tempt her, Jane tries to keep busy. And I joined the WI, art, upholstery, flower club, Meals on Wheels. Brought you your lunch. Walking club. Doing all these activities keeps me very, very busy and stops me thinking about food. Tonight, it's Jane's turn to host the book club. Well, they look cheesy, don't they? They're not, though. They're almond. I've just opened a big packet of crisps, which I went out and bought with great excitement, actually, because I never buy big packets, and just some nibbly bits. So it's just a good excuse to get together, and they're lovely ladies. How, what will you be doing in relation to food? I won't be eating any of it, but I should just, just offer it round. Some of the ladies that are coming tonight won't know that I have an eating disorder. In fact, most of them won't know. This evening, she's catering for ten people. Right. I don't have a, have a problem with people knowing that I'm a, a recovering anorexic, but I do have problems with the bulimia. I I'm so embarrassed about it. I like to keep quiet about that. <laughs> While Jane likes to keep quiet, husband Graham wants to talk. He's had to live with Jane's eating disorders all their married life and feels it's a heavy burden to shoulder. Once a month, Graham attends a support group for eating disorder sufferers and their families. My name's Graham. My wife's had an eating disorder for about 30 years and I find it helpful to come to these meetings um, and meet other people in a similar position. You know, the sooner anorexia and bulimia are treated, mm. the better the outcome. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise you mm. get into a situation like your wife and it just mm. goes on oh, forever. No, 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 no. Mm. Well, I mean, she was fine for 14, 15 years mm. when she had the children, but yeah. unfortunately... You know, when, when, uh, when her father died, uh, it all started it off again. again. Everybody's arriving at once. Hi. I enjoyed it. I, enjoyed it. I didn't enjoy it until the end. And then really? with the twist, and then I thought, oh, perhaps it's not that bad after all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the sufferer doesn't realise how they're perceived by other people because you're just so inwardly drawn, really. Well, they're very, very self-obsessed. Mm. Mm. Not the easiest mm. of people to live with. No. Possibly not. <laughs> <laughs> Before I found the support group, it was a very lonely existence. It's the fact that you, you realise that you're not the only person in the same situation. That's the big thing, because you tend to feel so isolated um, when you're dealing with a, a person with an eating disorder. Are those homemade there? No. <laughs> I noticed that Jane likes to feed others. <laughs> but not herself. Thank you for handing them round. Today, Jane has her appointment with her GP to check her weight. She tells me that if she's dropped to the critical BMI of 17.5, her doctor will confiscate her driving licence. For Jane, there's a lot at stake. I always get terribly nervous, and I don't know why, but I do. Um, I, I, I get very worked up when I go to see him. I suppose I worry about my weight, about the, if my, in case my weight is dropped and I can't drive. So how are things? How are you, how are things going? No, yeah, I'm I'm feeling really well, thank yeah. you. Yes, yes, really well. Good. And mood? I mean, the mood was pretty good anyway. Yes, no, mood's excellent. Yeah. And concentration, good. Yes, yeah. yes, reading lots of books. Motivation, and, do yes. stuff. 
Yes. Exercising? Mm, probably a little bit too much. <laughs> yes, I was going to wonder, yeah. Uh, what, what would your normal sort of exercise be sort of per week? What would you do normally? I normally do about an hour and a half a day. Yeah, of walking? Walking, just walking yeah. the dogs. That's, that's quite a lot, really. Um, and I don't power walk. So I mean, I think I think for somebody who is a normal weight, I'd be really delighted. I think for somebody of your weight, I'm, I'm, we'd obviously have to be careful. I mean, provided you're maintaining your weight or it's, or it's going up, then OK, well, it's good because it's good for the osteoporosis. After three decades of living with eating disorders, Jane now has the bone density of a 92-year-old. Right. Okay. Osteoporosis, or thinning of the bones, um, is one of the most debilitating effects of anorexia. Mm -hmm. Um, wait. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Do you want to have a look? See what it's doing. So there we are. Uh, so good. That's excellent, isn't it? That's gone up. That's two kilos. Excellent. Right. So. Uh... Well, I don't feel happy about that. Jane has asked Dr. Harney not to reveal to me her actual weight. Right. Oh, it's interesting. I mean, actually, your BMI is 18.7, mm -hmm. so that is, you know, that's very good. So you don't feel happy about it? No. Uh, no. But part of you must think that it's healthy, mm. do you? Mm. And I'm enjoying having much more energy. Yes, yes. Do, do you feel that size is sort of normal for you or not? I haven't been this weight in years. No, no, yeah. Um, Hopefully was that a shouldn't. shock, or did you expect it to be like that? It was a shock. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't weigh myself at home. No. Good. Well, I, 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 I'm delighted about it. Mm. Excellent. Well, lovely to see you. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased. I think you're looking great. Thank you. Excellent. I'm surprised Jane's unhappy about her weight. She gets to keep her driving licence, but I can see for her it's more complicated than that. With lots of patients with anorexia, it, it's, it's really a, a question of come to, coming to some sort of compromise. And I think there is this sort of mid, midway between where the, where the patient is happy with their weight and where the medical profession is happy with the weight. And you come to this sort of delicately sort of tuned balance in the middle. Uh, and I think that's where we are. And hopefully we can keep it there. But Jane seems really shaken up by the news. I need to work on it. I need, I need to work because my reaction is to restrict my food, to lose that weight. I panic. I panicked and thought, oh my goodness, I just I was really, really unhappy about it. But I, I know, deep down, I know it's, it's just bizarre and, I, and I'm, I must just accept it. <laughs> The desire to lose weight seems to override all common sense with these women. It's almost like an addiction. In Exeter, I visit Georgia, who has a history of anorexia. Seven weeks ago, she had her third child. Already, she's obsessed with losing weight. She's started a rigid diet and is weighing herself every day. You want to stand on the view? Hang on a minute, let's get them right. I know I shouldn't weigh myself every day, and it is silly because sometimes I don't see a change, and then that makes me panic, and then it's difficult to like eat for the day then. But that's what I do. So I weigh myself in the minimum like possible every morning. <laughs> so I'm, co I'm probably slightly less than yesterday, but not much. I don't know what I expect every morning. Like I say, when I get on the scales, it's kind of like I expect it to have like, dropped drastically. And obviously, rationally, I know that that's not going to happen. But, yeah, I still keep weighing myself every morning. So it's a bit crazy, really. What's crazy is that for 29-year-old Georgia, dieting has had horrific consequences. At her lowest point, when she was 18 years old, she weighed a shocking four stone 10 pounds and was hospitalised under the Mental Health Act. In order to get to look like that, I, at that point, was eating basically an apple a day and exercising as much as I could, 
using laxatives and just generally like totally obsessing over like weight and food all the time. Georgia told me it all began when her parents split up and her mum moved in with a new partner, taking Georgia and her siblings with her. I felt like because my mum was making the decisions about where we lived and who we lived with, I felt like I didn't have any say in anything. And so that's probably why I resorted to this. Why I chose food, I don't know. But it was my weight and food were things that I could control. They were, I could control what I put in my mouth and I could control what happened to my weight. <laughs> He's going to be the first one to fall off on the grass. When Georgia got back together with childhood sweetheart Kenny, she decided she wanted children. So she forced herself to eat so her periods, which had stopped, would come back. Go and get it then. Morgan, don't give up, look. Her first son, Bailey, was born a healthy seven pounds, but only months later, Georgia started to relapse. Instead of losing the weight sensibly, I just started to like cut massive parts of my diet out. And so before I knew it, I was down to like about seven stone. And all my obsessions around food came back. Obsessions around food, exercise and weight seem to be common traits for all women with eating disorders. Georgia became fixated with apples. The apples used to have to be a certain colour and a certain shape and a certain size. And I would travel to every supermarket in Exeter trying to find these particular type of apples. I've, I used to go to get an apple and I was told no. <laughs> and I felt quite difficult about going to the fridge. If I had too many apples to fit in my fridge, I would then take all the apples out and line them up in order of the ones which were perfect down to the ones which I'd bought that were borderline. And then the ones that were left over, I would smash them into the ground and then throw them away. you a cabbage tomorrow, all right? Put a bit of this cabbage. <laughs> Kenny's love and support helped Georgia. She gained weight and went on to have two more sons, Morgan and Kobe. But Kenny knows he needs to keep a close eye on his wife now she's dieting again. I do worry about her. And my biggest concern is that if she gets that target weight what she wants to be, will she not be happy? Will it go further and will she end up in hospital? It's become increasingly clear to me that for these women, eating disorders are nothing to do with skinny celebrities or size zero. They're all telling me that their bizarre relationships with food are about control. Trying to control the chaos of their lives or the pain of their past. When I next visit Tracy, I can tell that things are still difficult. Well, the last sort of two or three weeks have been pretty tough. Been binging most nights, um, to be honest. And I've been, I had two exams at university uh, for the, my law degree that I'm working on. And on top of that as well, this is the, the worst time of year for me because it's the anniversary of my mum's death and I, you know, still struggle with that even after all these years. What, what's your, what is your remit? What have you got to make? When you think you want. Tracy admits she's still binging and vomiting four times a week. I wonder how her 14-year-old daughter Emily is coping. Children always have this image of their parents being strong and being able to cope. And things like when your parents break up and you see both the parents crying all the time and then when you find out something like this, you realise actually they're just like us. They can't just cope with things because they're older. They're just because they're still human. This eating disorder is a way of her coping. Fair enough, maybe not the most, the best way of coping, but my aspiration is to be as good as mum as she is. And I know she doesn't think she's a good mum, but she is. She's the best mum I could think of. So I'd love to be her, just take away the eating disorder. Tracy knows how hard it is for her family, 
and she's got herself on a waiting list for a course of counselling sessions for her bulimia. In the meantime, she's trying desperately hard to help herself. Positive beliefs are something that you do, you have to try to, every time you have a negative thought, you have to try to replace it with a positive one. These are my beliefs that I've done um, here. Positive, internal and general, and they've got to be, which is why they're called pig beliefs. For example, um, I refuse to give in to my problems. Knowing that wine makes her liable to binge, Tracy's also decided to cut back on the booze. So I went out today and bought some fruit juices and I'm going to have a glass of this with my dinner tonight instead of wine um, and hopefully that all will help. It's a step in the right direction. Well, I decided I would attach a bell to the fridge door so that when I open the fridge, it will ring so that hopefully it might just... If one time it stops me from having a binge, then it's worked. It's done its job. So, has it worked so far? Uh, yes, it has a couple of times, but not often, not often, to be fair. But I think that's because we've usually had a couple of glasses of wine, so do we care about a bell? No. But now I'm on my tropical fruit juice with any luck, it will work. So that's the plan, anyway. But tonight, the kids are at their dad's, and Tracy knows her homegrown strategies won't be enough to hold her back. So she's put in an emergency call to her stepsister, Debbie. Sometimes if I'm a bit vulnerable, being left on my own is, you know, it leaves me open, you know, susceptible to having a binge. So by going to stay with Debbie um, for the night, I'm cutting that possibility out. I had quite a hard time. Yeah. There's nothing wrong in... You don't want to be self-pitying, that's why you won't accept that. But what you've had, what you've gone through and go through, is a lot more than a lot of people. That's OK to think that way. Well, yeah, I agree with you. To, yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. I but then I just still think... Have you taken why, as, why is it that, that's, that's, that other people have the same issues okay. and have the same problems and they don't do what I do? I can't begin to imagine what she's going through or the whys or wherefores, but I wasn't going to just grab hold of her shaker and say, oh, don't be so stupid, just eat something. Because obviously it's not as simple as that. She's an intelligent person. If it was that easy, she'd do it. That's, that's probably the, the biggest thing about this illness, is that of all the people you'd have thought it would happen to, why her? Why has she got such a bad perception of herself? I know she will get there because she's determined, she does get through, she does cope. So I shall be there for her. Two weeks into Georgia's campaign to get down to eight and a half stone and I discover she's taken up running again. Well, exercise is massively important to me. I can't imagine my life without some form of exercise. George has amended her diet plan and has now cut out all carbohydrates. But she feels she's not seeing results quickly enough. I haven't lost any weight, which to me just makes no sense because obviously I am really strictly following this diet plan. And like Kenny keeps saying to me, he's worrying because he thinks I'm hardly eating anything. I'm literally just sticking to my three meals a day not really snacking in between, and if I do, it'll just be fruit. So I reckon I'm probably eating about 1,500 calories a day. <laughs> I can't quite fathom out what my body's doing at the minute. And that's a bit of a dangerous place for me to be in, I think, because it, it's easy then to go back in, into old habits. Um, these are my new scales, and I got these because they're digital ones and they're really precise and I thought that was important for me to be like weighing myself accurately. And the last time I weighed myself, I was eight stone, nine and three quarters. Oh, it's eight, nine and a quarter. So I've, I've lost half of a, of a pound, basically. <laughs> So I would have expected to be lower than that today. And that's what, what that's kind of what I struggle with, really, knowing what to do now.
I can see George is fighting a constant battle in her head. She knows she has to be careful not to slip back into anorexia, but losing weight is still her goal. Oh, I smell that banana. And with her eldest son's birthday coming up, even the thought of doing something as simple as eating cake is causing her distress. There's certain things which I don't think I'm ever going to be able to allow myself to do. And the experiences that I could have with my children and my family that I'm not going to have because of this thing which is in my head, really. It's, it does get me quite upset because I just think, you know, I'd, I want to do those things with my children and with my family. But I just can't. Sorry. <laughs> In the Cotswolds, Jane's two kilo weight gain seems to have sent her into a panic too. She knows she needs to resist the urge to starve herself again. In desperation, she's decided to try hypnotherapy. Easier, more comfortable, more relaxed. And the important thing to learn is that as you both physically and mentally relax, then you're calm. It was absolutely wonderful. It was really relaxing, I felt. First of all, I felt heavy and I felt warm. I could feel warmth from the inside. And then as she talked me through it, I felt lighter. And I felt, felt as though I was floating. It was lovely. Jane's hypnotherapist has given her a CD to listen to every evening until her next session. And if I fall asleep while I'm listening to it, all oh, that's good. Well, how many hours does it go on for? It's half an hour. Oh, so it's only half an hour. You won't fall asleep while you're listening to it, then, no. will you? Mm. Okie doke. Well, I'll talk to the children and find out whether we've got a portable mm. CD player. Oh, let's have a sip of that. Well, I like the music. I'll be downstairs. No need to make an effort to relax. Just do what you're doing. Get yourself settled. It may work if she wants it to, but of course the, the bottom line always is that when no, no matter what has been tried, if at the back of her mind she doesn't actually want to get better and get rid of whatever it is that's controlling her, it's not going to happen. When I next see Zoe, she's preparing herself for her night out with friends. 46.2. Looking at it, the overall picture, there's definitely an upward trend, and that's really good. <sighs> Tonight will be the first time that Zoe's gone out for a meal without limiting what she eats beforehand. All day today, I've made an effort not to restrict my eating at all, so I've just had normal breakfast, snacks, lunch, um, just as if I wasn't going out which is really important, um, and resisting the urge to do extra exercise as well. I don't know what's going to be on the menu, so it's going to be completely spontaneous, which is probably a first for me. <laughs> Her friends meet regularly for meals out. Until now, Zoe's made excuses for not going. It's a big step for her. Today, I'm walking a part of Offa's Dyke with, with the walking group friends in the pouring rain. So we must be absolutely start raving mad in this weather. When we finish the walk, we're going for a pub meal very apprehensive about it because I don't like going to restaurants that I haven't been to before. Somehow I feel more secure if I know what's on the menu. 
I'm a little apprehensive, and I'm, 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 no, I'm not a little, I'm quite apprehensive, but I'm putting it to the back of my mind. Well, cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers, cheers. Yeah. cheers to good another day. good walk. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't know the menu, then, then I, I do panic, in case and there's not going to be fish or something on it that, that, I, that I will consider my safe foods. This is Jane's first meal out since starting hypnotherapy. I'm going to have the vegetables with noodles. Sitting down and, and choosing the food with friends, I, I do find it, find it difficult. I feel as though they're watching me. I'm sure they're not. I'm sure it's my imagination. Thank you. My sister's a real gadget. Each mouthful she takes is a minor triumph. <laughs> Small steps like these are hugely significant for Jane and Zoe. Meals out at difficult occasions. Having spent time with these women, I now realise how complex and overwhelming anorexia and bulimia are. Here's to Zoe. Well done, Zoe. Thank you, Zoe. Georgia has reached her target weight of eight and a half stone and for now is managing to stay there. But some foods are still off limits. Happy birthday to you. One day I'd like to be able to think that I could like eat birthday cake and enjoy those sorts of experiences with the boys and with the family and feel normal about it and not get stressed out about it. But at the moment, I just know that it's not something that I'd be able to allow myself to do and that's just something that I've got to accept for the time being and, and hope that I can, you know, those sorts of things are things that I can do eventually. I hope one day all four of the women I've met will be able to enjoy their food rather than see it as the enemy. For the moment, Jane believes that hypnotherapy might finally be the answer. I'm not actually having any thoughts of bulimia at all. I'm saying that ever since I've had the hypnotherapy, I really haven't. And every day that I get through it and don't have any thoughts, I just, just, just cannot believe it. Um, Daniel, come on, I'm going to be late for school. Tracy also remains determined that she will eventually beat her bulimia. I don't want this to be around anymore. I want rid of, I've had, had enough now. I want to live a normal life and think in a normal, rational way and just have a healthy relationship with food, really. And after years out of the workplace, Zoe has started a voluntary job as the battle to reclaim her life from anorexia continues. I feel so lucky. I just, that is my overwhelming feeling, really, of being so, so fortunate. Firstly, of course, to have the family I've got and to have my husband who's been so supportive for me, but also to have had the treatment that I've had. I think with anorexia, you, you can't do it on your own, actually. You can really want to get better, but it's, it's impossible to do without help. <laughs> 